Our scripture reading is from Jaden. Congratulations on gradu graduating. Um, but please give your attention to our sister Jaden. Good morning, church. Today's scripture comes from the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. May you be blessed as you give attention to the reading of God's word. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. This is the holy and errant word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to God. Thank you, Jaden. Great job. I'd like to introduce our relatively new youth pastor, Roland Lee. Come on down. Uh, thank you, Jaden. Um, not that I wasn't giving my full attention to the reading of God's Word, but I saw the huge trophies in the background and wondered <laughs> what they were. Uh, if you could list it in the comments, maybe if some of us could guess what they might be, you know, I'm sure that would be an interesting read. So uh, this morning we'll be wrapping up our series on Second Peter, and I'll be sharing a message on how to prepare for the Lord's return. But just to look ahead for the next few sermons that are coming up, um, once again, um, Pastor Ted, next Sunday, will be sharing a message on the crisis that's addressing our nation and how the church should respond and how the church will respond in this time of crisis. So please uh, invite friends, family members, anyone who wants to hear the response of the church. Um, and so we have that coming up in three Sundays or two Sundays we have uh, Father's Day and then on the last Sunday of June we will be beginning our New Testament series on Joshua so without further ado how do we prepare for the Lord's coming um, the Lord is coming and the Lord is coming soon and how are we to prepare for his coming you know I was having a conversation recently with a friend of mine who they've officially entered into the nesting phase in their pregnancy. Um, that's this phase where the parents begin to start shopping for the new coming baby. You know, they start buying cribs, clothes, bassinets, swaddling cloths, I mean bottles, everything. They just start packing all that stuff into their house. They start painting the walls, they start putting up decorations, they start uh, making the house safe, you know, putting locks on the cabinets and, and covering up all the sharp edges with foam. And as I was listening to my friend share about all the money and all the time that he's putting in to, to make his house uh, a safe place to receive the newborn, I was reminded that the amount of preparation that they are doing is equal to the person they are expecting. The amount of preparation we do is equal to who we are expecting. You know, when we're expecting friends to come over, we might clean the house. But we might not, depending on who is coming. You know, if it's our best friend coming over, it's going to look the same. However, when our pastor comes over, we prepare. The house is spotless. The bathroom is clean. You know, we have tea and fruit cut up with the little tiny forks ready to go because the amount of preparation is equal to who we're expecting. And it's this preparational phase, this nesting phase for Christians that Second Peter closes with because who it is that we are expecting. In verse 14 it says, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, since we're waiting, since we're expecting the coming of the day of God, since we're expecting the exposing of earth and the work done on it, since we're expecting the passing away of the heavens, since we're expecting the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, since we're waiting for Jesus' second coming, we're waiting for Him who saved us, 
Him who bore our sins upon the cross. Him who took our punishment. We're waiting for the person who was spat upon and beaten for our trespasses. He who snatched us up from the flames of hell itself. Since we are waiting for He who loves us, He who was merciful and kind and gracious to us, how are we to prepare? How do we get ready for the Lord's return? Because the King of glory is coming. And so Peter gives us four things to prepare for. Four ways in which we're called to prepare. As verse 14 continues by saying, Be diligent to be found by Him without spot or blemish, and at peace. The first command that Peter gives us is to be diligent in killing sin. Sin's a beast. It destroys humanity, families, communities, societies. I mean, it corrupts the heart, cripples lives, and stumbles our walk in Christ. It brings destruction to all it touches. Sin is a wild beast in the hearts of men and women and people, leading us astray. As the famous hymn goes, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. How do we kill it? How do we kill sin in our lives? You know, I was recently watching one of those National Geographic shows, and, and they were hunting a warthog. You know, also known as Timon's friend Pumbaa, from uh, The Lion King. And if you don't know anything about warthogs, you know, they look nice in the animation, but in real life, they're ferocious beasts. They're fast, they have a low center of gravity, you know, they hit like a truck with their, their, their tusk. And, and the tusks are razor sharp, you know, they just cut through skin and flesh. However, as I was watching them go to capture it, I noticed it wasn't just one macho warrior guy going for it. It wasn't just the, the hunter person, but rather, it was a group of people. There was about five or six, you know, some with nets, some with spears, some with a bow. And they all went together and captured it and took it out. Just because sin is personal doesn't mean that it can't be killed in a community. And one thing we can do to help kill sin in our life is to join a local church when churches begin to open up. Because in that local church, we're going to find people who have overcome the same things that we're trying to overcome. People who have struggled. People with the same things that we have struggled with or might be struggling with. And the beauty of the church is that we share wisdom and knowledge and insight in how to overcome, how to find victory, how to take away and kill that sin in our lives. And so, when churches start to open back up, make a commitment. Join a local church, commit to a local small group, and be part of that community that goes after sin in our lives. Maybe, for some of us, that very first step might just be to recognize that it is sin. You know, I remember when, I was, when God first saved me, my pastor told me that I was a very sarcastic person and people were getting hurt by my comments. And I brushed it off saying, you know, those people are just, you know, they're, they're marshmallow people. They're very soft, you know, bubbly people. They grew up in a bubble. They just need to, you know, they just, they just need to be exposed to some reality. And I brushed off what he was saying to me. And then a funny thing happened. My friends started saying it. And then the people and my classmates at school started saying it. And I realized something. This is sin in my life. And I need to deal with it. So if you have a, a parent or a sibling or a friend that keeps nagging you about something, maybe, maybe, just maybe, what they're saying has some truth that we need to deal with. Joining a local church to help uh, to come together with brothers and sisters to overcome sin in our life. Listening to people who might speak truth into our life. These are all different ways that we go about killing sin in our life. As Colossians 3, 5 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
I mean, this isn't a total list of sin, but he's painting a picture of sin. It has everything to do with earthly things, nothing to do with Christ's likeness. And so the call is to put it to death. Don't let it fester. Don't let it grow. Something that might seem small will eventually become big each day. You know, John Owen was one of the great Puritan preachers. Matter of fact, uh, historians label him as the Prince of Puritans. He said this. He said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. His life work was one of killing sin. Killing one sin after another, after another, and after another. And this is what Peter calls us to do. Be diligent in killing sin. Don't let it grow. Don't let it fester. Don't let it take time. But rather, be diligent in killing it. So take time this week. You know, just identify one sin in our life. It doesn't have to be the biggest one. It could be the smallest one. But let's identify one sin that we can address, that we can kill. And if we need some help, seek counsel and wisdom from an older brother or sister in the faith. Verse 15 and 16 says, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul, who wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Secondly, we're called and commanded to think biblically and prepare as we await the Lord's return. You know, a few verses earlier in chapter 3, Peter wrote about a misconception that was floating around. People were thinking that Jesus was never going to come back. And this opened the door for scoffers to follow their own sinful desires and live however they wanted. And it's this kind of misunderstanding that also led some to twist what Paul wrote about Christian freedom in Christ and turn that into a license to sin. This kind of misunderstanding, this kind of twisting of scripture. Peter says, no, don't do it. Don't think like this. Don't be misled by this kind of ignorance and be led into destruction. He says, count it, view it, think about it. Understand that the Lord's return in this manner, that his delayed coming equals salvation. Remember, Jesus has not yet returned because he does not want anyone to perish. He loves and cares about his creation so much that he delays his return so that one more is saved. The day that he returns, every single unbeliever is doomed. Therefore, he waits one more day. He waits for one more to be saved. But the day will come when God cannot bear sin and evil any longer. But until that day comes, we're called to think biblically so that we can live intentionally. As Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Right now is not the time to relax. It's not the time to enjoy the pleasures of the world and just go on vacation. As if we had all the time in the world. But rather, as 2 Corinthians 6 says, Working together with Him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is a favorable time. Behold, now is a day of salvation. Paul is writing here to Christians in the Corinthian church. Christians who have received the grace of God. And he's compelling them not to receive the grace of God in vain by recognizing what time they are living in. It's the favorable time. It's the day of salvation. And it's the same period that we're living in right now. Because Jesus is delaying His return so that people may be saved, so that people may come to know Him. 
So don't waste this precious opportunity that we have in this time of grace. Don't waste this precious time uh, of waiting that God has given us. Identify a person. One person. It could be a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, a relative. Just one person who is a non-believer. And let us pray for them. Let us lift them up to the throne of heaven. Let, them, let us lift them up to the grace of God in prayer for God to save them, for God to redeem them, for God to transform them. You know, identify just one person in our social circle that we could pray for and, and, and think, how can we win them to Christ? You know, as we begin to, to think biblically about the return of Christ and how this is a time of salvation, we get to live intentionally by reaching out to others to do the work of salvation, to be a part of God's work of salvation in the lives of people. The amazing thing about praying for someone that isn't saved is that as we pray for them, as we cry out for them, God seems to give us wisdom on how to reach them. Could have a neighbor that likes, you know, pizza. And as we're praying for them, as we're praying for them, hey, the thought might be, why not buy some pizza and invite them to have a time of sharing? And, and so win them and encourage them and share the love of God with them. Third, in this time of waiting, we're called to be planted daily in the truth. As verse 17 says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. In Acts 20, Paul was writing to the elders at Ephesus. I mean, these were leaders of the church that he was writing to. These were the dedicated, devout, faithful followers of Christ. And to this people, the group of people, he wrote them, reminding of something that he did while he was with them. In Acts 20, 31, it says, Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease, night or day, to admonish everyone with tears. For three years straight, every day and every night, Apostle Paul did not cease in admonishing them. This means warning, teaching, correcting. For three years, day and night, he was exposing them to truth. Every day and every night, he was daily planting truth in them. You know, traveling back in time, when I was in seventh grade, after school, I would often go to the library and uh, with my friends and hang out there until my mom came to pick me up. And one time in particular, I remember that she was late, you know, about an hour and a half, maybe two hours late, you know, just one time. And I remember as I was sitting there waiting for my mom, a thought came across my mind. You know, I should go wait inside, you know, it's a hot day, you know, I'm burning up. I'll just wait inside and she could come get me. But then I remember what my mom said. No, sit there and wait for me. And as I waited again, I thought, hmm, maybe she's lost or she forgot about me. So maybe I should go and call her. And then I remembered again, no, sit there and wait for me. And then another thought came across my mind. You know, maybe I should go across the street and sit down at the bus stop and wait in the shade for her there. And when I see her, I can wave and get her attention. No, sit in that spot and wait for me. Maybe she's in the wrong spot and I need to go and look for her. No, sit there and wait for me. Yeah, the sun's going down. I should start walking home now so I don't have to walk home in the dark. No, sit there and wait for me. You know, if I had listened to any one of those other voices, I would have drifted from where I should be and gotten myself into a mess. Paul planted truth daily in the lives of the Christians in Ephesus because it's human nature to forget. 
It's human nature to drift. And that's why we need to be exposed daily. You know, if we're not reading daily, commit today, or we'll begin drifting tomorrow if we're not drifting already. Whether it's a little bit or a lot, that's not the issue. It's the daily exposure of truth, the daily admonishment of God's holy word in our lives, the daily receiving of the source of life for the word of God in our life. You know, don't wait until next January to start the you know, yearly Bible reading program. You can start today. Just download the app and it's simple. Maybe even start a reading group with your friend. Whatever it is, however you do it, find a way to read and be planted daily in the scripture so that we don't drift. Another very practical way would be to listen to podcasts right now. I mean, some of us are commuting to work, some of us aren't. But listening to a podcast on the way to work is a, is a tremendous way to help turn that ungodly commute I mean, there's no traffic right now, so that, that's a good thing. But, but it, it's a way to turn that commute into a time of refreshment. A time of refreshing for our spirit, for our souls. So as we're waiting for the Lord's return, we're called to be preparing by diligently killing sin. To be thinking biblically so that we can live intentionally. To be planted in truth daily. And finally, to be growing daily. Verse 18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory now and to the day of eternity. Amen. You know, there was a deathbed confession of a 75-year-old man that went something like this. You know, at the age of 50, the doctors told him he didn't have much time left. And so he spent every day living as if it was last. He filled his heart up with joy and happiness, held nothing back. Traveled the world, went to Europe, went to uh, Africa. He went to all the continents. He ate the most delicate foods, enjoyed a life of luxury. He did everything that he wanted to do. And 25 years later, as he was passing, he confessed to his pastor that he accomplished so much and did so much and lived life to such an extent in these past 25 years. Things that he never imagined that he could accomplish, he did. But he did not grow more obedient in Christ. As he looked back on his life, he didn't grow more dedicated to Christ. As he looked back, he didn't grow more in Christ. And the one thing he regretted was that he did not grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. You know, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I but the grace of God that is with me. You know, to grow in grace means that our growth is motivated by His grace. That His grace is the compelling factor. That His grace is the initiating of our transformation. That His grace is the fuel that burns our passion and, and pursuit in life. It's God's grace, Paul says, that made Him who I am. It took me. His grace shaped me. His grace molded me and created me to be who I am. It was grace that grew him to be who he was. You know, I read an Instagram post saying that we're going to come out of this quarantine time, this stay-at-home time, in one of four ways. Either we're going to come out of it we're looking like a chunk because all we did was eat junk food. And, you know, don't get me wrong, it, it's hard not to, not to snack. You know, we're at home, the cabinets are there, the food's there, everything is available. Food is delivered from Postmates or Uber Eats for free now. 
It's hard not to eat and continue eating. Secondly, we might come out of it looking like a hunk. You know, we get the PX90 in, we start working out, we start exercising, you know, doing the calisthenics, running up and down the stairs. Thirdly, some of us might come out of it smelling like a skunk. And I understand this one. You know, we're at home, we don't see anyone outside, we don't go anywhere. You know, Zoom doesn't have that smell option available yet. And so, you know, we wash our face, but we don't brush the teeth. I get that. However, a fourth way that we could possibly come out of this quarantine time is like a monk. Like a monk. Because we got serious about the coming of the Lord. Because we chose to begin to be diligent about killing sin. We began reading the Bible daily. We began thinking biblically so that we can live intentionally. And we began receiving the grace of God and being filled by His grace and began to grow. It's our choice to make. It's our choice how we come out of this quarantine. And I hope and pray that all of us will come out looking like a monk because we made the conscious choice to worship God, to honor God, and to draw closer to God. Let me pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you have not yet returned because your delay means salvation. Salvation for us, salvation for our neighbors, salvation for our friends, salvation for the community, salvation for the world. Because you delay your coming, Lord, there is one more day, one more opportunity, one more chance for the gospel message to go forth and to save and redeem your people, Lord. Holy Spirit, quicken our minds, convict us, Embolden us to share your message of grace, to share your message of truth. Convict us to take your word seriously. Convict us to honor your word and become obedient. Let our hearts be revived according to your work in our lives. Let joy be found upon our lips and praise be found in our lives. God, let us choose you in this time of quarantine. Let us choose to honor you and to worship you, to draw closer to you, because you give us the opportunity for it by delaying your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.